Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody. Well, welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's show, I want to talk about why every Christian needs to understand church history. And before we get started, we need to make clear what I mean by this, because what, I, what I'm not saying is, is that you neglect your Bible. You see, coming from the Reformation, the, the Reformation wanted to help people to recover the Bible as a central place in the life of, of the Christian, meaning that they would read it daily and in the, to be central in the, in the, in the preaching of the word. So the pulpit would be central in the life of the church and in the ministry, in the practice of the church and in the, the church's mission. So to do this, they had a phrase called sola scriptura. Scripture is the final authority for the faith and the practice of every every Christian for every square inch of our life in Christ. Today we talk about, when people talk about this, it's often thought, well, uh, you're just Bible people, Bible only people, meaning you're just against church history of, of any kind. And so what Bible only means is that we should know and understand Scripture. It's true that we are Bible-first people because we're to be like the Bereans, as we're told in Scripture, and to rightly handle the Word of God, as we're commanded to do. But it isn't only that we're Bible-only people. We are Bible-first people as Protestants and as Reformed Evangelicals. And still, we're not against history. Uh, as if we can come to our convictions apart from the Bible, it's not possible. And yet, in many Christian circles today, there's a trend towards thinking we are Bible only people, that we are against church history, and that the only thing we need is the Bible. Yes, we should be a people formed and shaped by Scripture, but this does not discount the role of church history. For example, one of the most critical debates in the church's history, it occurred between Augustine and Pelagius. This debate would even shape much of the Reformation debate between Martin Luther and Erasmus, the outcome of which potentially demonstrated the necessity of a firm grasp of Scripture as Martin Martin Luther clearly demonstrated. In fact, the biblical theological insights of Augustine helped shape both Luther and Calvin, both of whom were instrumental in shaping many of the leading Reformed and Puritan theologians. And so as Christians, we are not Bible-only people. We are Bible-first people. And by being a Bible-first Christian, I'm advocating that we take the Word, that we study it, that we rightly handle it, as 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us. And so, rightly handling the Word is first done by grounding oneself in solid convictions about the Bible itself. But we must begin by asking where we get those convictions. And the answer is, yes, the Bible teaches much about itself, But we also gain insights from others about what the Bible says, gaining a wealth of understanding from other learned theologians who have gone before us. In fact, Ephesians 4.11 tells us that the Lord gave us teachers, and this means we need teachers to rightly handle the Word of God. And so when when others suggest we are only Bible people, 
I would su submit to you they are wrong. We are Bible first people because the Bible shapes and molds our thinking and our character. But even so, there, there's nothing wrong with learning from people who rightly handle the word of God. That's good and it's right. And, and it's also important also to say that a discerning Christian knows the difference between saying they are a Bible-only person and a Bible-first person. They know this uh, difference because they understand that being discerning, it means testing, it means examining, it means analyzing what is being taught, which is Paul's meaning in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 when he says we are to test all things and to hold fast what is good. We are not to hold to anything that isn't biblical. We are to test, we are to hold fast to what is good. And many people today even suggest that our faith is our own, and in some sense, they're correct. But ultimately, our faith is not our own. Our faith belongs to God. Because as children of God, we belong to God. And we identify with the body of Christ, which means we also must align ourselves with those who have gone before us in Christ. It's popular today to, to think, I'm a Christian, and then to live your Christian life as if you're on an island like a lone ranger. That's This lone ranger Christianity, it misses a big chunk of what biblical Christianity is all about. Jesus brings sinners who were once destined for hell and brings them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the, the Lord Jesus. And without Jesus, there is no hope of having faith, let alone having an anchor for it. And this is why we need to be Bible first people without ignoring, without discarding the church's history. In fact, we need to say that the church has, has good answers to contemporary questions facing the church from debates ranging about the proper understanding of the atonement to the Trinity and more. These are issues the church has dealt with and answered decidedly. And when we ignore the insights of church history, we open ourselves to air and to the shifting sands of theological controversy. In fact, it, it's important to say that church history, it tells us not only what the church has taught about a variety of topics, but also why they matter. In fact, the stories behind the various councils uh, uh, and, and what led to them, for example, they help us understand what the framers of these councils were. Men of godly character who owe Bible first and not Bible only people, they gathered together to talk openly from Scripture about issues facing them and their ministries and to come to biblical and faithful convictions responding to the issues of the day. In fact, the church, we need to say, needs to adopt this approach because we face challenges on every side. Challenges on, on gender, on sexuality, on social justice, on overreaching civil governments. My, my point is this. Christians must learn from the scriptures first. But we also must learn from the church and how the church has responded to controversy. In fact, theological controversy has been an opportunity for the church to engage in doctrinal clarity on a variety of subjects. And this is vital because we're living in a time when history is not just being rewritten, rewritten to suit whatever and whoever is in charge and then taught to the masses, but it's also a time when history itself is doubted. And in America today, we have a council culture that is willing to tear down anything that isn't politically correct, that isn't politically expedient. Even if, even if we remove real monuments that represent our nation's history, American citizens and members of the body of Christ are, are both in a fight to preserve the truth. And more and more, our history is is being eroded away because of this explosion of rewritten or removed history. And if we refuse to learn from our history, we are doomed to repeat history if we will not learn from 
the sins and the mistakes of, of those who have come before us. And when church history is neglected, we will be thrown back into a period of history known as the Dark Ages. Church history, though, gives believers many good reasons to have confidence, not only in how the Lord worked through people in various areas eras of church history, but also in examples of how to stand boldly and steadfastly on the Word of God. Now, we as Christians, we have great answers from the Word of God, but we also have excellent answers in the, in the history of the church. And we need to learn from Scripture, but we also need the example and the teaching of those who have come before us. And in fact, if we don't learn from those who come before us, we will be Bible-only people when we should be Bible-first people. You see, thoughtful Christians are those who know that we need to not only know what Scripture teaches, but we also learn from the insights and uh, as they've studied Scripture from teachers of the past, faithful, trusted teachers of the past. Now, church history matters because it explains the why of how people arrived at the convictions they did and thus why they made the stand they did. We need church history today, but first and foremost, we need the Bible. Church history can help us grow in our understanding of Scripture. It can help us to be, to be good and faithful servants of Christ. You see, dear Christian, we have good answers, both from Scripture and from the teaching of the saints of old. And that means that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to learn from those who have gone before us in the faith. Now, another reason that church history is important is, and we see it, the outworking of it, not only from the Bible, but also understanding what the church has taught, is every, every year or two, Ligonier Ministry, in conjunction with Lifeway Research, puts out an excellent study it's called the State of Theology and Christianity. One aspect of the 2020 survey focused on the deity of Christ. And on the State of Theology website, they rightly note that historically evangelicals have affirmed the authority of the Bible and salvation by Jesus Christ. And the Bible testifies often to the deity of Christ. He is God incarnate, the Word made flesh. And so it may be unsurprising that the majority of the general U.S. population denies the deity of Christ. And still now, almost a third of evangelicals agree that he was merely a great teacher, the study shows. In fact, the study shows that 52% agree and 36% disagree that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And so the question of whether Jesus was a good man, a teacher, a liar, is one that the Bible has a clear answer on. All we have to do is open the Gospel of John and read the seven I am statements given in John's Gospel that go back to Exodus 3.14 where God says, I am who I am. And we can also go to Paul's epistles and on and on. And where we learn is, is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And it's not just that Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he would do but that he would soon return in his second coming. In fact, church history has much to teach Christians today, and, and it provides examples of responses to wrong doctrine with sound biblical doctrine. And so, as we dig in further in this episode, I want to give you some examples of this, of how the deity of Jesus is not only biblical, but it's the position that the church has stood fast on now for over 2,000 years. So throughout the first 300 years of the, of the church, various heresies had come and gone. Few of any of the heresies would cause significant issues like those of Arianism. In fact, Arius had been a presbyter in the Alexander Church. Jonathan Hill in the History of Christian Thought says this, The Arians argue that God is, by nature, essentially uncreated and owes his existence to nothing. And that being so, they argued the Son could not be God because he owes his existence to something else, the Father. And if the Son was begotten by the Father, then there was a time 
when he did not exist, which is hardly compatible with being God. Moreover, how can there be two gods? Now, to break this down, Arius' belief centered on how the sun was not divine, but rather a creature or an archangel. And this caused conflict in the church because the church at the time believed that Jesus was both fully God and fully human, as Paul taught in Philippians 2. And at the Council of Nicaea, it was called to deal with the issues raised by Arius' excommunication and also to settle the meaning of what of what doctrine was exactly orthodox. The Council of Nicaea ended up formulating a biblical response to Arius with the Nicene Creed. No other figure in church history shines as brightly as Athanasius. Athanasius was born in 295 AD. He quickly rose through the ranks of the Alexandrian church. He became a personal assistant to the bishop and, and was there at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This man had a strong faith, a sharp mind. His argument was based on the belief that the Father and the Son are one. And so Athanasius argued that the divine will has nothing to do with the decision of the will. Jonathan Hill, in the History of Christian Thought, writes, It is the nature of the Father to beget the Son, just as it is in the nature of the Son to be begotten. This means that the divine nature itself exists in this way, on the one hand begetting, and on the other hand begotten. And Athanasius was heavily, heavily persecuted for holding the line on the deity of Christ throughout his life, and also on the Trinity. At Nicaea, it was distinctly clarified what the church would believe, and Arius' views were strongly and roundly rejected. And as the church began to form, more attacks came against it, and so the need to clarify precisely what Scripture was was becoming more and more critical. And to determine what Scripture was, they used the following text. One, the writer had to have been with Christ during his earthly ministry. Two, they, they needed to have been uh, apostles who, who believed to have been commissioned by Jesus himself. And three, they were authorized to spread his teachings. Now, the, the controversy on the person and the work of Jesus continued to rage between two of the East's most influential churchmen, Cyril of Alexander and Nestorius, Patriarch of Constantinople. Dr. Gonzalez in the story of Christianity, the early church to the dawn of the Reformation, volume one says, this debate primarily revolved around who Jesus was. Was he fully God and fully man or not? Nestorius insisted Christ had two natures, while Cyril, branding this belief in to Christ, said he had only one. Now, Dr. Hill, in the History of Christian Thought, writes this, The Western Church stepped into this situation when Leo, Bishop of Rome, wrote a famous letter to Flavian known as the Tome, in which he approved of the condemnation of Eucides. And Leo spoke of the two natures of Christ, one divine and one human. He taught that even after the incarnation, Christ retains these two natures, but he remains a single person identical with the second person of the Trinity. And the controversy surrounding the person and the work of Jesus was settled at the Council of Chalcedon, and Emperor Theodosius in 451 AD called this council to solve this problem. And the council approved of Bishop Leo's teaching from the Ptolemy and put forth the Chalcedon Creed, an expansion of the Nicene Creed. Jonathan Hill in his handbook to the history of Christianity says this, This creed agreed with Cyril that Christ was one person, identical with the pre-existent Son. And still it agreed with Leo that after the incarnation, he possessed two distinct natures, one human and one divine. Now, the great Princeton scholar B.B. Warfield's work on the Bible is exceptional, but so is his work on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. In fact, he says, in proportion as the grace of the saving God in Christ is obscured or passes into the background, in that proportion does Christianity slip from our grasp. Christianity is summed up in the phrase, God was in Christ, reconciling the world with himself. And where this great confession is contradicted or neglected, there is no Christianity. Well, Dr. Warfield is right. 
Biblical Christianity is a revealed religion whereby God in Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, He has revealed Himself in Christ alone. In the Incarnation, what we see is Jesus, fully God and fully man, came on a rescue mission under the sentence of death to save sinners at the cross. Jesus said in John 19.30, it is finished. And now Jesus pleads the merits of his own blood on behalf of sinners and they are saved. Jesus now serves as a high priest over his people and he lives to serve as their advocate uh, and intercessor. And so as we return again to the state of theology, the study shows that 52% agree and 36% disagree that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And as we considered in this show today, it's not only the Bible's teaching that is clear, but also the church's stand upon the word that matters. And to that point, what the study shows is how we view the Bible itself matters because Scripture reveals the truth about God who has revealed himself as the I am God. Seven times I mentioned the Gospel of John shows uh, how true this I am statements are. The I am God in Exodus 3.14 is now the incarnate Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Biblical Christianity grounds itself in the truth of all that Scripture teaches. And so Scripture is clear. As the morning sunrise testifying of the glory of Christ to come and of Christ to return at the sunset of redemptive history. Christ is all and all throughout the Bible. From the first words in Genesis 1 to the last words in Revelation 22, Jesus is at the center of all of Scripture. And the state of theology, it's a critical study for our times today because it shows where we are at in the history of Christianity today, right now. See, the deity of Christ is absolutely critical to the health and the well-being of the church. Without the deity of Christ, Christians may as well rip out the New Testament from its pages. The deity of Christ is everywhere in the Gospels, where we see it in the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. In the epistles, we see it Everywhere from Romans to Jude and in Revelation as Christians, we don't have merely a good teacher, but we have one in Jesus who is fully God and fully man. He is not only a good teacher, but he is also the God man who alone can offer the forgiveness of sins because he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And so friends, today we have talked about why every Christian needs to understand church history. And the reason is very clear. We need to not only be Christians who are grounded in and shaped by Scripture, but we also need to be Christians who understand what the church has taught. You see, God has given us faithful teachers of the Word in the history of the church. They they did what Jude 3 says. They, they contended for the faith once and for all, delivered to the saints. They, they uh, when... When asked, they gave a reason, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, for the reason, for the hope that they have, and they did so with gentleness and respect. Many, many, many of, of the great Christians gave of their lives for the sake of the honor and the glory of Christ. And they did so defending the Scriptures from error, from opponents, because they loved the Lord and They love their fellow man, and such a love is what we need today. You see, we need to love not only what God loves, and God loves his word. He loves his people. He loves his church. God has given us the scripture to to know him. It's the only way to know God. But God also has given us teachers to teach us from his word, both from the very beginning of the church to the present day. We need to learn from those people, those faithful expositors, those faithful teachers, those faithful defenders of the Word of God. We need to learn from them. And so that's my encouragement in this episode. Don't just say, you know, all all I need is my Bible. No, you do need your Bible. You do need to read it. You do need to study it. You do need to meditate on it. You do need to memorize it. You do need to apply it to your life. You do need to be in a local church where the word is preached verse by verse and line by line. 
But make no mistake about it. You, you not only need those things, but you need to learn the lessons from the history of the church. You need to learn them because those things that have come before us, they are, they are happening right now. As Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. The, the, the same things that have come before us, they are coming full circle now today. If you don't understand where ideas come from and what they mean and, their, and the consequence of them, how can you stand against air? And the answer is you cannot. You know, um, my love for church history first started when I was a teenager. I, I just I just remember just falling in love with reading my Bible and church history, and that love is, is continued. I love to read the Reformers and the Puritans. Uh, I love to read about church history. But before I even do any of those things, I read my Bible every day, every morning, before I get started every day. You know, it's important. It's vital for you to be in the Word. It's vital for your health as a Christian. It's vital for your growth in the Word of God. It's vital that you be in a church that preaches the whole counsel of God verse by verse and line by line. But it's equally as vital for your Christian life to know what what the church has deemed orthodox and what the church has deemed not orthodox for you to know what the church has actually said and what the church has actually stood for and upon for the glory of God and the good of all people. So my encouragement is keep reading your Bible, keep studying it, keep memorizing it, keep applying it to your life. Keep sitting under the word week in and week out, day by a week in and week out, every Lord's Day, year by year. Uh, enjoy it. But also learn from those who have come from uh, the past. Learn from Calvin. Learn from Augustine. Learn from John Flavel. Learn from John Owen. Learn from R.C. Sproul. Learn from John MacArthur and, and many, many others. There is a rich tradition of sound biblical and theological teachers. And that's been my encouragement here today because we need to not only be shaped by the and formed by the Bible, but we should know also what what has come before us, what those opponents of the faith have have said and what they've taught. Because those errors, that heresy is continuing to come back again and again and again. And we need able, not only defenders of the scripture, but defenders who know what the Bible says and what, how the church has responded to those errors and to that heresy. So I hope that this episode has been helpful to your life and ministry. Uh, we're definitely going to continue to talk about reading and studying the Bible and engaging in uh, understanding matters from church history and their importance of it as we move forward. But um, I, I thought that this would be a good foundational episode for us just to talk about what these things are and why we should even care about them. So again, I hope it's been helpful for you. And I want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of the Equip You and Grace podcast. Until next week, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.